Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Leslie Fitzpatrick from Mercy Hearst University, also in the Department of Applied Forensic Sciences. However, this discussion is going to shift a little bit to the way past, not super way past, but sort of recent way past, 1880 to 1910. So we're going to examine some human remains from a burial site in Uinta County, Wyoming. So as you guys probably remember from high school chemistry, we talk about periodic table elements, and this is defined by solely by the number of protons. But if you mess with the number of neutrons, which are the neutral charge, right, then you can get what is called an isotope of an element. Some isotope, isotopics of elements are radioactive, and some are stable. The radioactive ones, gone like that, many of them. So we're gonna look at the stable ones. And the stable ones that we're most interested in are carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. When we report stable isotopes, we report them as a comparison of relative abundance within a sample that we're looking at to a standard. And this is given in per mil values. So it looks like a percentage with an extra O, and it means parts per thousand. When we talk about particularly water, we're going to talk about the Rayleigh distillation process. And this is where lighter isotopes evaporate faster than heavier ones. This also dictates the water that you drink. If you drink water from a desert environment versus one from here next to lovely Lake Erie, it tastes the same, right? But the isotopic composition will be varied, and this is based on things like aridity, latitude, altitude, uh, closeness to the major water source, which of course is the ocean, right? And this relates to meteoric water, so rainwater. And we're going to go under the assumption that people in the past and present, most people drink tap water, right? So it's a local water source. And this leads to different drinking water in different geographic locations having varying isotopic compositions. So once that, once we drink, as Amelia's back there drinking right now, sorry to point you out, dear. Um, she's back there drinking right now. That's put into her body and it becomes incorporated into her bodily tissues. This is what we're trying to detect with stable isotope analysis. So human body oxygen sources, where does the oxygen in our tissues come from? Well, in part, it comes from oxygen bound and consumed foods. So when you have, you know, if your donut's back there, there's water in it. That's why they're not all dry and crumbly, right? There's water in it. Once you take that into your body, in your gut, it's released, and the oxygen becomes incorporated in your tissues. As well, when we breathe, that's my reminder to breathe. Um, when we breathe, the oxygen that we've just inhaled, in part, becomes incorporated into our tissues, and most importantly, imbibed oxygen. So every time we drink water, that becomes incorporated into our tissues. Now carbon, another stable isotope. Main forms of carbon assimilation and fixation are three different pathways. We have C3, C4, and CAM, Crassulacean Acid Metabolism. CAM, CAM plants are like your euphorbia, your cacti, and pineapple, which is delicious, but could you eat pineapple and only pineapple and survive? Probably not. So can plants are ones that don't constitute a bulk biomass, therefore don't constitute the primary source of dietary composition for pretty much any given species. So we kind of put cam to the side and we don't really think too much about it, which is a good thing because the isotopic values for cam overlie those for C3 and C4, which kind of muddy interpretations. It's kind of nice that they kind of sit by themselves. So the rest of this discussion is going to be focused mainly on C3 and C4. That's why I'm kind of putting CAM to the side. It's still there, but we just don't really consider it to be a bulk of biomass. And the main forms of photosynthetic processes are light-dependent reactions and light-independent reactions, such as the Calvin cycle. So we're going to talk about Hatch-Slack pathways and Calvin cycle. Now, C3 plants are your most, most of those guys are your temperate species. Uh, they're well adapted to cooler, moister environments, and it's pretty much what you eat, right? Wheat, barley, rye, sugar beets, beans, rice, potatoes, all your woody trees and most of your fruits. So probably what you had for breakfast this morning, right? <coughs> now, C4 plants, 
plants, only about 3% of terrestrial plants use C4 pathways. And this is about 8,200 species, so not a ton, right, comparatively. All these guys are angiosperms. And common examples of this, maize, well, sugar, right? Sugar cane, too. Um, millet, sorghum, most forms of am amaranth, and cruciferate, broccoli. Now, terrestrial 13C values, C3 species are negative 29 to negative 25 per mil with a mean of 26. C4 is negative 15 to negative 10. And most importantly, looking at those means there, they're pretty different, right? So it allows us to put things into kind of discrete little pockets. Now, we've seen this before, right? Those values, those are your means. Now, what about things that eat those, right? So we have fractionation in the tissue. So we have appetite values of negative 13 to positive 1, depending if you're eating a solely monoisotopic C3 versus C4 diet. And appetite is the inorganic fraction of bone and tooth. So the hard stuff, right? Collagen is your more flexible tissues, like soft organic component. Carnivores, same thing. You can see it's vastly different, these values, except for the C4. But still, different, right? Terrestrial and plant nitrogen values, moving on to nitrogen, are a result of, the, um, a result of combination of nitrogen fixation, ammonification, and nitrification. So nitrogen cycle, you probably read about in the sixth, seventh grade, right? And <clears throat> terrestrial plant values are about negative 10 to positive 10 per mil. And most terrestrial plants tend to have values ranging from negative 6 to positive 6. Now, this is just terrestrial because when we start looking at marine environments, they have different pathways and different nitrogen and nitrification and fixation pathways. And a lot of this has to do with things like runoff, um, which I'm sure a lot of our scientists in the room right now dealing with stuff in Lake Erie are familiar with nitrogen runoff into Lake Erie causing blooms and all this mess. So we're going to focus mainly on terrestrial plant values with this discussion. Now thinking about terrestrial mammals, we have a range here of nitrogen values. You can see marine values, nice again, because they're in discrete pockets, right? Freshwater fish versus marine fish, nice pockets, right? It's really convenient for discrete analysis. Now this is a nice depiction here. We've got carbon and nitrogen here. This is from collagen, the organic fractions of bones. So marine ecosystems versus terrestrial ecosystems. And we'll see this diagram a bit later when I plot the values from our actual population onto it. Now geographic mobility. We're talking about oxygen, individuals of unknown origin. We can do this not only in the way past, and in the way, way past, but also in the present with forensic applications as well. Um, we're looking at mobility of, over various temporal frames, so looking at primary and terminal decades of life. And primary decades, your teeth, right? A lovely record of, depending on which tooth it is and how old you are when you take the tooth, could be a record of gestation in your mom's belly, right? Or it could be your independent diet as a child. So we say generally the teeth, depending on which one we pick, is about the first decade of life. The last decade of life, we're going to look at your axial skeleton, or your, yeah, your axial skeleton. So like your ribs, your ribs are the ones we preferentially choose, and your appendicular skeleton, your dangly bits, like your arms and legs, those regenerate over the last 20 years. So we get this different pattern, right? Teeth, 10, first 10, last 10, last 20. And, pardon, I'm gonna go back one. Shorter temporal patterning we can do on things like muscle tissue, skin, and hair is wonderful because it grows from here, right? It goes down. So oldest to newest, we can do little snips and we can actually trace you week by week, which is really interesting for movement. Now, diet composition, short and long-term patterns. Looking at the short and long-term patterns, we can look at trophic level shifts. This can be indi uh, indicative of general health. Because if you have someone who has normal values, normal values, particularly if we're looking at things like hair and we're tracing, right? Normal values, normal values, everyone's eating a nice, relatively the same diet, and then all of a sudden you get this huge nitrogen spike. Well, one of two things has happened. Either they've taken to eating a very fancy diet of just lobster and seafood, 
or they perhaps are in a period of starvation where their body is beginning to break down its own tissues. So this gives us general health indicators as well. Now moving on to our case study here, the Red Mountain site in Evanston, Wyoming, and you might be like, wow, these guys don't look like what I imagined for Wyoming. Well, there's a reason. In 1844, the Treaty of Wangya uh, was between the US government and the Chinese government. And what this did is it allowed for opening of the port of Guangzhou in the Guangzhou province in southern China. And this is still a major port for commerce. Um, and if we think about the global map, right? China's not super far from the west coast of the US, right, comparatively. So could potentially take a boat from Guangzhou and go to, let's say, California. Imagine that. 1848, because 1844, everything's open. You guys are welcome to come in, right? 1848 to 1855, we have the California Gold Rush. So we see a massive influx of people seeking fortune in California. And since it's conveniently located closest <coughs> to China, why not just get off there and try and strike fortune? In 1865, E.V. Crocker, an executive of the Central Pacific Railway, and the Central Pacific is going to be this red line here, says, hey, why don't we try and create the first transcontinental railway by connecting what's already been built by the UP and sections that were added later by UP and different corporations. But they say, hey, let's try and basically build this so we can connect everything, make this transcontinental railway line, because rail is the transportation of the future, right? So he has a little problem, though, because there aren't enough people living out here at the time to assist, except that labor force, because if you're looking at the dates, these guys who came over from the California Gold Rush don't really have anything to do. So they start hiring Chinese individuals who have come over during that period as railway workers. And they're still hitting a wall because there's not enough people to lay the rails, even with all those people. So because it's opened up, Cornelius Kupenschnapp, who happened to be a Dutch sea captain who was very skilled with trade, particularly with the Chinese, said, no problem, I'm already running boats from the US to China and back and forth with goods, why not throw a few people on it too? So he starts recruiting people to come over en masse to the US to work on the railway. Problem with this though, records aren't great. People are given basically lot numbers and they were not necessarily sold to the railway, but they were kind of indentured servants to the railway. So they were brought over and you would get a lot of 20 male Chinese workers to work on your railway. They didn't have names. They didn't have faces or identities. They were just 20 people. Okay. So this is part of where we have problems with our record keeping. And in 1869, huzzah, the first transcontinental railway is completed, which is awesome. And the individuals who worked on it, because they were specialists and they actually created it, were retained to provide support. In addition, they were doing track repair, mining, which is huge in the state of Wyoming, and service industries. There's a reason why there's that clothing company called Chinese Laundry. It was a thing, okay? Uinta County, Wyoming. We have the city of Evanston, and you can see here it's right on the Utah border, like smack dab on the Utah border. You go like 20 miles around Utah. Um, right there, but it's also a coal rich area, so there's a lot of mining down there. Uh, we see a large number of individuals who were involved with the railway, involved with mining, stationed in this point. Now, Red Mountain is a little bit of a misnomer. This is the city of Evanston in that Uinta County, kind of down there near uh, Utah. The point here that you see mapped on there is Red Mountain. And you may say to yourself, that doesn't look much like a mountain, and it certainly doesn't look red. Well, Red Mountain is a misnomer. It's literally a green hill. Um, and the best they can tell from some really strange historic records is some of the miners who came to work at this area had previously been employed in another place in the state of Wyoming called Red Mountain Copper Mine. So they just kind of said, hey, we're the Red Mountain dudes. And here we are. 
So it became known as Red Mountain. And in 1982, excavations, um, I think they were putting in a parking garage. I'm not quite sure what they were doing up there or doing some mining activities, uncovered the remains of six individuals. These were all adult males. Um, so they ranged in age, estimated age from about 23 to 48. Uh, they all appear to have East Asian ancestry based on biological profile. And as Dr. Dirk Matt mentioned earlier, we look at ancestry, right? So we're going to estimate East Asian ancestry. And they had mixed mortuary offerings. So they were buried in this weird mix of traditional East Asian style with some of the clothing, but then there were dudes wearing bow ties. So it was very odd. It was a mix of East and West. And in 1880 to 1910, one of the things that we need to note is the, the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act was enacted in 1882, which prevented Chinese individuals from coming into the US. So some of these individuals were interred prior to that and some after. So this can in, uh, influence our interpretation of mobility, right? Were these people here? Were they the children of the miners? who came over um, for the gold rush, or were these individuals here already? Where did, these come, where did these people come from, right? So our major questions, we're looking at mobility differences between individuals and within individuals, right? So teeth versus bones, right? Where do they move? And between individuals. Also, overall diet uh, differences both at the beginning of life and at the end of life. Are we seeing um, a continuance of diet as a socio-cultural identity factor? So are we seeing people eating comfort foods, eating the same foods they've been eating their entire life as a means of reaffirming their identity across the diaspora? So mobility, Guangdong province of China, where we're assuming most of these people may have come from because of Kupenschnapp's efforts, uh, is negative eight to positive, or negative four per mil for the oxygen drinking water, right? And so looking at the teeth for origin, they all fall, okay? Evanston, Wyoming, in comparison, they don't appear to be local, right? Now, looking at the last 10 years of life, bone, we're looking at rib, only one of them shows to have been in Evanston for at least a decade or more. And but what about these guys here? Where are they from? Well, if we're gonna map this, we can see here, if we're mapping this into the US, because I said it was from the Guangdong province of China, those are the values. If we map it to the US, basically they could have been from anywhere, right? But looking at the dates, it's more likely they were actually from China than they would have been from here. Now, if we see this, this value here, it could be anywhere from this intermountain region. Same thing for these values here, these 15s. And this 10 is just all over the map, right? He could have been from Erie. But, but what we have said before, it takes 10 years to regenerate this. It takes 20 years to regenerate this. So it's really a combination of values over those 10 years. It's basically averaging it out. So it is possible that they were in Wyoming during that time, but they just weren't there long enough for their bones to register it. Only one guy was. So what does this mean? Significant mobility across the lifespan. Probably originated in China, definitely died, and were buried in Wyoming, right? So diet, carbonate, we're talking about appetite, that hard part of the bone, right, that inorganic. We have delta 13C, which represents total diet composition. We also have collagen, which represents mainly the protein source. And we're also looking at delta 13C, but it's a slightly different type of delta 13C we're trying to extract, and nitrogen. So our carbonate values, so looking at the hard part, right, that appetite, we have these values, they're all in the 20s. And if we remember, C3 species, mean 26, mean 12, what are they mainly eating? C3, right? What's a primary C3? Rice. Now, interpretation, minor dietary shift between the final 10 and final 20 years of life. So, of course, we have our appendicular elements being the femur and the tibia and stuff for the last 20 years of life and the ribs of the last 10. And what we're looking here is we're seeing minor inter, or intra-individual shifts. None of these were statistically significant. So basically, 
and there was no statistical significance between individuals here. So possible sociocultural identity of affirmation across the diaspora, meaning they were probably still eating the same foods they always ate. And the little wiggles between these values are most likely due to sourcing. Because what you're seeing is perhaps in China, you have pig fed solely with rice, where in the US you have pig fed with corn. So how do we get to that? Well, we're going to look at nitrogen values too to kind of affirm this dietary shift. So what we see here, if we plot, they're all plotting about the same. And I made this guy into black because he doesn't have a, a friend to compare to there, a rib. So we can see clusters, they just kind of wiggle. And so they're wiggling onto an area here where they're eating mainly C3 plants, mainly eating herbivores, right? If we map it onto the marine ecosystem, they're out in the middle of nowhere, which tells us they're not really eating a lot of seafood. So they're eating mostly local stuff, but they're eating the same patterning of foods. If we map it onto this line, we can see they're mainly tucked towards the C3 protein line, mainly with C3 energy. They're mainly eating rice, they're avoiding corn and things. And they're not really close to the marine protein line or the C4 protein lines. So they were eating mostly stuff that, this is the last 10 years of life, mostly stuff that was fed with things like wheat, barley, rye, rice. So summary, mark geographic mobility across the lifespan with minor dietary pattern alterations. Future research, I'd like to sample the guys that I couldn't get sampled because they were too hard. You know what, I have proper cutting tools, I can go back and resample those. And additional carbonate collagen sampling for um, confirmation of what we've already assumed. And I'd like to thank University of Wyoming staff for permitting me to destructive to analysis these guys as well as my doctoral advisor and the Department of Applied Forensic Sciences at Mercyhurst for their gracious review of this train wreck of a presentation yesterday. So, yay, thank you. I'm sorry for going over a little. Any questions?